Welcome to the Flare Build Podcast. Today's guest is John Milliken. He has been a staff engineer at Stripe for three years. Previously, John has been a Borg Site Reliability Engineer at Google and is a main author of the Remote Asset API PR and Proposal. Today, we invited John to talk about the ideas behind the proposal, the value it brings to Stripe, and what it can potentially bring to other companies. Now, over to your hosts, Tatiana and Zach, the co-founders of Flare Build, the first consultancy and product-based company focused on Basil. We're here with John. John, how are you doing? Thanks for coming on the podcast. Hi, John. Uh, doing good. Thanks for having me. Great. So where are you calling from? I'm calling you from my kitchen in Tokyo. Okay. Wow. Tokyo. That's awesome. Well, what motivated you to end up in Tokyo? Well, about a year and a half ago, my apartment in the San Francisco Bay Area was scheduled for demolition. And I was looking at the different parts the World Stripe has offices, and of all the choices, Tokyo seemed one of the most interesting. Yeah, definitely interesting. That's for sure. Our geography today is super diverse. Like, so Tokyo, Zach is in New York. I'm in Sydney. Well, we're definitely global. So, what was the transition like from being a Google SRE to to joining the team at Stripe? The transition was well. I knew that when I was joining Stripe, I was going to be moving towards a smaller company in Stripe at the time was 700 people, which is the smallest place I'd ever worked as a software engineer. And at 700 is almost exactly 100 times smaller than Google's at the time, 70,000. So I knew going into it that some parts of its internal engineering infrastructure would be a little rough around the edges. But I hadn't quite realized exactly how much was involved at working at Google and how much the, how much the internal development team at Google worked hard to make sure that engineers had a highly productive environment. So when I joined Stripe and it seemed like there was a lot less headcount to spread around on internal engineering needs. Some of the things like uh, builds in particular was more of a rough area. Yeah. How many people are at Stripe right now? Uh, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I believe that we're above 2,000 now. Yeah. So it's like in three years, like three times growth. Uh, about that, yeah. It must be a huge, like basically, burden on your shoulders as a person who is responsible for, you know, productivity of everyone. Yeah, I am uh, not on the developer productivity team at Stripe. My work on Basil has actually been a twenty percent project. My full time work is in our compute infrastructure, which is roughly the equivalent of Borg SRE at Google, and I'm helping Stripe migrate to modern container technologies such as Kubernetes. Wow. Cool. And can you shed a little bit? I know you, you don't work full time on Bazel. It's just your, your passion project. But uh, can you shed a little bit of light on the, the current state of the Bazel setup at Stripe? Yeah. So Stripe's initial use of Bazel was focused on Scala as a replacement for SBT. And the primary benefit of Bazel in that context was its performance and ability to have better caching on large projects. Over time, we've started using Bazel in more places because of its ability to combine builds across multiple languages. In a sort of classical build system, you might have a B language specific. For example, Rake is aimed at building Ruby. Go build is aimed at building Go. And CMake is aimed at building C or C++. Bazel as a language agnostic build system gives us a way towards combining multiple languages. So we might take a library written in C++ and an application written in Go and use Bazel to combine those in a safe and reproducible way. Yeah, that makes sense. What about like remote cache and execution? Like what do you use uh, at the current setup? Our current Bazel remote execution is aimed primarily at security over speed. Although there are some speed benefits we get from it. For us, the main motivation is the ability to sandbox individual build actions. We run every build action in a custom executor that uses Gvisor as a sandboxing technology, which allows us to, for example, remove network access from build actions and ensure that even if malicious code was downloaded as part of a build, it wouldn't be able to escape the sandbox, for example, via an external vulnerability. 
So you're saying you have basically your own implementation of remote cache and remote execution, right? That's correct. Yeah. So you have like full control over the server. Yeah. So that sounds awesome. So what made you actually make a proposal for remote asset API? What wasn't enough in like in the current APIs? We had two significant challenges related to external hosting in our build environment. The first one was availability. Some of our builds depended on assets hosted in, for example, github.com or other third-party hosting. And sometimes those hosting providers would be unavailable or even temporarily block our downloads due to rate limits. And we wanted our builds to be independent of third-party hosting status. The second issue was security. We had a goal of requiring all third-party assets to have a checksum committed to our repository. And Bazel does support checksums when downloading, but it doesn't have a way to enforce that all downloads use a checksum. Yeah, I think you have basically, if you if you skip like checksum in your HTTP archive or something, there is just some warning or something, right? That's correct. Bazel will warn you that the checksum is missing and it will print out what the checksum was that it saw. Um, but there's no way to require checksums at the basal level. By having a remote asset downloader, we can inject policy decisions into the download path. For example, requiring strong checksums on all assets. That makes sense. Cool. I want to dive a little bit deeper on the remote APIs because you said earlier Stripe has already implemented the remote APIs in terms of cache and execution. And I just want to drill into really what was missing there and why you really needed to dive in and create a new proposal and implement something else here. Yeah, the Bazel remote execution and remote caching APIs were from their names aimed at the, the build action part of a build. So once you've already fetched all your external dependencies, you send them off for compilation or whatever, and Bazel handles that through existing APIs. The stage before actions, when it was looking up external dependencies and fetching things from the internet, did not have any coverage in the previous remote API protocol. Okay, so I guess the next question we have here is, what was the experience like integrating this functionality into Bazel? So you had to obviously dive into the code, make some code changes, and then uh, do the necessary politicking to get both the proposal through and, and land the, the final PR. So um, how, how was that experience? Yeah, I think there was like a initial proposal for you for you. And like when we were preparing for this interview, you were like referenced us to original, original proposal, original proposal and consolidated proposal, right? So give us some background and our listener some background what it looks like to go through original, original proposal to the code. Yeah. The work to get this new API in place was split broadly into the design phase, which was the various proposal documents and the implementation phase, which is writing the actual Java code. The design phase took significantly longer than I was initially expecting. It seems that there were many similar but unrelated changes that other people in the Basel community wanted. And they viewed my design proposal as a point of opportunity to get those in. So when I sent off the initial proposal for a single RPC that would allow Basil to, to delegate the downloading of files, it also saw some interest from in people who were hoping for remote file system support or support for remotely unpacking large archives. And a great deal of time was spent in the design proposal trying to figure out whether those made sense to merge into it or whether they should perhaps be handled separately. In the eventual negotiation, the original proposal was named Remote Repository Cache. And that was merged to create the Remote Asset API. That would be used by other build systems to handle a mutable remote asset storage system. For Bazel, the only use case was downloading pre-existing files from known URLs. But there were other build systems, such as BuildStream, that wanted to be able to push content into the, the non-content addressed store. So the, the proposal that was uh, ended up being submitted to the Bazel developers and approved contains four RPCs versus the original one. Uh, the additional three RPCs being capability to download directories and to mutate the artifact store, neither of which are... And those additional features are not used by Bazel today. Once the 
proposal was accepted, which took approximately one year. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I met, like I said, that was substantially longer than I originally expected when I set off on this project. Yeah, but it's um, like serious change to like API of few clients, right? It's not some feature. It's like negotiating no. with every with everyone. One of the things about expanding the scope of a design proposal mm. by four times is that it also increases the time required to review and approve it. And I think that in the original proposal, if it had been kept as is, perhaps the time to review and approve might have been smaller. But uh, it's also unclear whether it would have been accepted by the remote API authors if the only client interested in it was Bazel. In the end, it took approximately a year for the design to be approved and submitted. After that time, I was able to begin writing code for Bazel itself to implement the client side. And that took approximately two to three months to get that in. I should qualify that by saying that Java is not my primary day-to-day -day language. So many parts of the code review involved just the Bazel developers walking me through how Bazel used the language. Yeah. So at Stripe, out of these four RPCs, which ended up being in Bazel, I'm guessing from what you're saying, you just used still one, right? The original fetch blob? That's correct. Uh, there's four RPCs that ended up in the remote asset API. Fetch blob, fetch directories, and then push blob. It sounds very simple. Yes, and uh, the original RPC there was fetch blob. That is the only RPC used by Bazel as a client, and that is also the only RPC that our internal implementation of the remote asset downloader uses. Yeah, you mentioned like the security aspects, which were like, super important for Stripe, obviously being like a huge financial company. Are there any reasons you're not using like fetch directory API, uh, like RPC as well? Yeah, one of the goals is to have checksums at multiple layers of the stack. The idea is that the Bazel client doesn't necessarily trust the remote download server. Yeah. And if you use the fetch directory RPC, then that is delegating unpacking of an artifact to the download server. Whereas if you only have Bazel fetch the original archive and then unpack it locally, then the Bazel client and the download server can be mutually untrusted. Yeah, that makes cool. sense. So if I wanted to take advantage of this today, assuming I had the appropriate backend support for this, how would I enable this as a developer? And what does that look like? After implementing and deploying your backend, you would want to instruct Bazel to use it. I believe the flag is experimental remote downloader address. There's also some auxiliary flags that control things such as uh, TLS settings and headers. And if you set the experimental remote downloader address flag to the address of your downloader, Bazel will use it for all downloads. It supports any URL schema supported by Bazel itself, which I believe is currently HTTP, HTTPS, and FTP. At Stripe, we also internally use the downloader to map from HTTP to some other protocols, specifically S3 which allows our Bazel builds to depend on files within restricted S3 buckets. Okay, I guess I wanted like Stripe like is amazing. You guys have control over server and everything, but I guess I wanted to jump in their shoes like of a smaller company and like walk through a scenario of why would I need to use this flag? Why would I need to use this API as a smaller company? I think for smaller companies, I'm assuming that rather than implementing a remote execution platform internally, they would be using a hosted provider. And I think for such a setup, the primary advantage of remote asset downloader is performance. You could, for example, imagine your assets being hosted in an American server and your build happening in a European cluster, in which case the extra round trip and latency of fetching the original assets might be significant. Whereas having a remote asset downloader with a cache within your own local infrastructure allows you to avoid that round trip and the potentially large time spent downloading things such as compiler tool chains. So basically for my local development, I have like something called like disk cache where I just store like whatever like remote cache has. And then I have like repository cache. And there's like a couple flags for that. Do I understand correctly, right? This API can basically eliminate repository cache and my repository rules will end up in the cache. That's right. When your repository rules download files, today they can be placed on disk yeah. with the repository cache flag. But that can't be shared easily between build workers. And if you have 
multiple build workers writing the same directory, that can be challenging to coordinate. Having a remote repository cache allows those files to be shared. Yeah, so essentially, even if you don't have remote execution in the context of like CI, right, you don't need to download it all the time, just cache your dependencies, right? That's correct. There are some dependencies that do not work with the remote asset downloader, and those are dependencies that are fetched by executing command. The obvious case there would be git dependencies, where the, the remote rules actually run the git command to clone a repository. So, so basically, but your normal stuff you see in the workspace, like HTTP archive and this kind of things, are just happily cached in your normal remote cache if you use this flag, right? That's correct. And uh, one of the main benefits for us is that existing open source rule sets that use HTTP archives do not need to be modified in any way to work with the remote repository cache. Yeah, that's amazing benefit from both security and like performance points of view. So this feature landed in what version of Bazel did this come out? Do you recall? I don't recall off the top of my head. I believe that it was one of the 3.x uh huh. Okay. So relatively recently, then, if it's in 3.x, would you consider this to be stable? I consider it stable. And at Stripe, we are using it as the only downloader implementation for many of our core repositories. The flag is currently marked experimental because the Bazel developers were reluctant to add it in without the experimental flag initially. I don't know if there has been a strong desire with other members of the community to remove the experimental prefix. And at Stripe, Considering the circumstances of 2020, fixing up that particular aspect of our build configuration has not been a high priority. I think that if there was somebody in the Bazel community looking for perhaps a straightforward first PR for Bazel, then removing the experimental prefix and stabilizing that flag might be a good opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And in one of our previous conversations, we had talked about the potential for open sourcing some of Stripe's work on the, the Gvisor action executor. Um, is that something that's worth talking about here? Sure, I'm willing to discuss it. Stripe has a philosophy towards open sourcing our internal code, which is that we're generally willing to do that for non-core systems if we can get perhaps one or two partner companies to help with the open sourcing. The goal here is to avoid open sourcing things that aren't going to be of interest to the broader community. When we've discussed our Gvisor-based executor in the past and tried to gather interest in open sourcing it, we haven't seen a lot of buy-in from other Bazel users. And even within Google, for example, the Google Cloud Bazel executor does not currently use Gvisor. It uses Docker for their container isolation. On the other hand, if there was a company out there who was looking for strong sandboxing and interested in collaborating with us on that, then I think we'd be interested in, in helping open source our code. Cool. It's really exciting. Hopefully some folks will listen to this and be inspired. Okay. In your day-to-day -day workflow at Stripe, do you actually use Bazel to compile code frequently or what does that look like? I work primarily in our Go code bases. And in that mode, I do a lot of Bazel builds for you know testing and development. For some of our other code bases, people interact with Bazel indirectly through a CI-based system where they push their changes, and Bazel is one of the components executed to build the final artifact. Stripe is incrementally moving more towards Bazel as a single build system, and I expect that over the next two or three years, our builds will increasingly surface Bazel as the primary touchpoint for developers. As for my day-to-day, -day, what that typically looks like is I might have you know, my Vim windows open and I'll be looking at some Chrome tabs to verify with RFCs or with existing standards documents what the code should behave like. I'll write the, the tests to verify conformance. And then once I have that done, I might you know, use Bazel locally to run those tests. One of the benefits of Bazel is that the build and test execution is fairly hermetic, so I don't have to worry over much about the current state of my workstation and what binaries libraries might happen to be installed there. And then once I have it running locally, then I'll push it to CI and CI will run, you know, verify that everything is good on the Linux platform. And once it passes that, then they can go into code review. Great. So how do people find you? Uh, are you on Twitter? Uh, I am not on Twitter. I am on Mastodon, which is a platform similar to Twitter, but with a less centralized infrastructure. Although, honestly, the best way to get in touch with me is through regular old email. Great. 
Yeah, we'll add it to the transcript. While we are on Twitter, <laughs> the Twitter for this podcast is Basil Podcast. So send us our, your feedback and uh, more questions for John and us. Well, thanks, John. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And on behalf of the Basil community, thank you for your excellent work getting this proposal over the line and implemented and merged. It's quite an accomplishment. So thanks a lot. Thank you for your time. Thank you again for having me. Thank you for tuning in to the Flare Bill podcast. Please like, subscribe, and tune in again with Zach and Tatiana for the next podcast in the series.